I want to start with something that has come up numerous times over the last couple of days, which is both in the papers that we've heard and in the, the conversations we've all been having, and I've been overhearing it, that we've all come to this, I think, with some understanding or some sense of understanding of what ambient music is. And that's been, to an extent, at least for me, kind of systematically undone while we've been here, at least undermined. Um, so I wanted to start with um, a question kind of related to an aspect of that. And I want to start with a small quotation from a, an essay by Martin Marx talking about music that Eric Satie wrote for a film, The Contract. And he writes this. He, Satie, meant to delineate a realm of functional music belonging uniquely to the 20th century. Music furnished on specification like an industrial product or music built like furniture, designed that is to provide comfort and support for some other activity. And then he quotes Sati directly. He says, what we want is to establish a music made to satisfy useful needs. There's also a quotation mark. Art does not enter into this. Furniture music creates a vibration. It has no other goal. It fills the same role as light and heat, as comfort in all its forms. Now, it seems to me that the word comfort is quite an important word uh, at least implied idea in ambient music, in the way a lot of us instinctively conceive it. And so my opening gambit to the panel is this, and it came up a bit in, in what David had to say in one of the questions from Johnny, I think. Does ambient need to be comfortable or beautiful? And as a follow-up to that, can it be unpleasant or even ugly? Can I just say one thing first? I think to take Eric Satter's words at face value yeah. is I know. Utter, utter foolishness. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but there's something interesting to bounce off. Yeah, no, the point that was made about the Zizek essay yesterday, which I haven't yeah. read his essay, but um, it talked about, again, it seemed to take his words at face value, which I think is nonsense. Sure, I'm just bouncing off the word comfort because I think it's, yeah, no, it's just it's an interesting pervasive idea. I just had to say that. Fine. Noted. Now we call it. <laughs> so, does ambient need to be comfortable or beautiful and can it be unpleasant or ugly? Who should I throw that up first? I mean, I can have two thoughts in response to that. One is mm -hmm. um, just about Satie's own pieces of furniture music, which don't sound very comfortable. I mean, they're rather <laughs> rigid and uh, mechanical. Um, so already there's some there's some irony there, and I I personally don't see the uh, subtle unpleasantness of ambient music as opposed to its beauty. So I think they can potentially coexist. What do you think know about the subtle unpleasantness? <laughs> it's a fantastic for Yeah, and well, in a lot of ambient music that I like. There is an undertone of dread, perhaps. Is this more extreme than the melancholy you were talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's a spectrum. It's, it's on a spectrum. Between melancholy, between melancholy and dread. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. Sorry. No, that's it. Oh, I was just going to say, I think there are some kind of examples of things like on band, but it's not all together. Oh, sorry. There's uh, there's quite sort of uh, on the solo side. It's uh, pleasant all the way through. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are a lot of possibilities. And, uh, it's how it's defined by the listener. As defined by the listener. Yeah, I mean, what what one person finds comfortable and which person doesn't. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. a very different kind of uh, interpretation of so what we do. But in terms of how, I suppose I'm thinking too about how we all, those of us who do, those of us who make ambient today, to whatever extent. I mean, David spoke a lot about the capital A ambient, which perhaps we would agree is designed not to be uncomfortable, which is part of this problem, perhaps. But I'm, I suppose I'm interested in whether the, the, the closer we get to uncomfortableness and to potentially ugliness, are we straying? Beyond what we would describe as something that's legitimate, uh, in part of the legacy of ambient. I don't think necessarily. I think, well, but 
for me, <coughs> the understanding around me is something which isn't necessarily intrusive, um, but something you know, talked about in this, in the tones and this sense of. Um, I think there's always an element of tension um, as well, and like this, this this sense of uh, almost hovering rather rather than uh, s uh, static. Um, there's, there's a sense of active listening and quiet. Um, so I don't think. And would an extreme of comfort work against that? Does it, does it shut that down? Well, I think, yeah, that, that, mm. that it's sort of an example of the perhaps capital A and yeah, perhaps yeah. That, um, that you end up with something which sounds monodimensional and vapid, perhaps, um, rather than something which has more depth, potentially. I mean, if you think about, if you're trying to make a, a space of listening, if you're meditating, for, for example, um, there'll be all kinds of thoughts and, and feelings that will be shifting constantly. Um, but for me, it's that sort of engagement with letting things be as they are, um, rather than trying to enforce uh, a particular mood. Um, and I really, really enjoyed that. We were talking earlier about the performance and how, um, rather than being kind of didactic, this is what we're trying to mm. uh, communicate. It, it's about making a space. Um, and uh, Tim was talking earlier about the audience being, uh, or making the glue. Um, and, and it was very much a sense of that, that interactive um, experience. You, you made a space for us to exist within um, and making our own of it. Yeah, and I suppose in, in your case, Andrew, it's a situation where, as we were talking as well, that the music, we could almost relax to an extent to the music. I mean, we were, we were immersed in the music, and the, the music is not kind of oppressive, and it's not unpleasant in that sense, but I found that your involvement was very useful as a kind of balance, in a way, like a stimulating element. Not the music wasn't stimulating, but it stimulated in a way that yeah, there's, a, there's a part of you thinking, what's she doing? Why is she doing that now? Whereas the music didn't raise the same sorts of questions, and I, and I thought that that was a, an interesting kind of balance again between something that I could kind of just sort of zone out to in a way, and, and it was kind of kept in, in check. By that. Is that part of what you were aiming at? Or? I would like to connect to uh, a little bit to that talk about yep. um, rituals. And um, uh -huh, yeah. like you know, something between the social media and process is uh, when you do it in front of the audience, in front of the reading. And um, in that sense, I thought of my presence that I need some sort of lesson. So uh -huh. I can preach what uh, is happening inside of me. But, uh, also, like the audience as association of thoughts and uh, the music between like uh, yes, this environment for this kind of ritual happening. Mm, when uh, uh, we put this question of asking the body, uh, every time we like I, I prepare for the performance, I am um, like trying to sense. What is being in the present time painful for me? What is pleasant? What is hidden? What is um, trying to come out? Yeah. And uh, I think the beauty for the beauty come across uh, in this sort of uh, questions and wonders. And um, uh, I, I said that um, there is a function of uh, the ambient and the performance. Uh, like you were talking in the world of function as a maybe in a, in a way that is um, uh, negative or mm. that is um, uh, restricted to what uh, happens in the mechanical industry uh, process. But function is also a concept. <coughs> and the professor was talking uh, like uh, 
um, for humans to acquire knowledge. We need this kind of ecstatic um, state of consciousness yeah. that uh, music can bring, and um, I need to connect that to, as a contrast to the world. Sure. And in fact, if I remember correctly, Ruth, you also talked about in terms of, a, of, of enacting this idea of kairos, you talked about one of the potential ways of that would be an overstimulation, a kind of saturation, which I was, I was pleased you mentioned that because it, it's, it's not come up very much in the idea of this, because I'm, I'm thinking here, you know, proposing the idea of ugliness and, and it's potentially, we can tap into a different form of ambient, potentially with a, with a kind of enormous barrage that overwhelms in a, in a quite different way, do you think? And there is the whole noise music field, which actually has a lot in common with ambient, we could say, is a kind of ambient music. But I think a lot of people wouldn't necessarily make that connection based on superficial ground, which is why I think it's good to throw the idea of openness and well, stuff into the world. I mentioned that. I, I referred to um, Young Joel Hans' mm -hmm. Psychopolitics, but there's another book by him called Saving Beauty, and he talks about the the dominant aesthetic sense of our present that's being smoothness. So like the smoothness of an iPhone or the smoothness of um, shaved bodies in pornography or um, the smoothness of um, uh, well, his name is gone completely out of my mind, very famous artist, uh, Jeff Koons. Jeff, uh, Jeff Koons oh, got, yeah. and uh, you know... It's also ties in the pornography. Yes, absolutely, yeah, they all tie in together. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's, he's talking about that in relation to a kind of roughness, so he's saying beauty has to have a roughness to it, to, to have a narrative, to have meaning. You know, because if you're asking the body, you, you're not just going to get smoothness, are you? You know, you're going to get all sorts of things. Um, so. Um, mm. You know, that the word ugly is problematic, of course. Um, because it's subjective? Yeah, it's subjective and um, it, 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 it means different things in different aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is, but I, I think it's I think it's problematic in the same way as the word attractive is for ambient too. It's just that I think the word attractive is a, is a concept that many people would instinctively think is kind of part and parcel of the, of the ambient. Yeah, but I think to go back to the Young Chol Han idea, that, that smoothness is applicable to capital A ambient because yeah, you know, it is yeah. uh, functional in some way. So it, it, in the same way that when musicians made music records, everything was on a um, you know, narrow bandwidth, which there, there couldn't be any spikes. Uh, the same is true of that kind of band. It's, it can't upset anybody because they're writing their pieces. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's good that you know pick the word interesting uh, as the old opposite of ignorable. You didn't pick attractive. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, we can be interested by uh, pleasant things and unpleasant things. And <coughs> just be interested in anything. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. absolutely. Okay, let's. Um, Let's take a slightly different tag. Uh, I brought a picture just because it, it sort of ties in vaguely, I think, with a way ambient may be used. I don't know if anyone saw, I don't read this paper I hasten to add, but I did see the headline a couple of days ago that we should all be doing this. <laughs> this was from The Sun, one of England's finest papers, a couple of days ago. A report saying that you know we're all very miserable and that we'd all be better off. Science tells us if we pop more of those, and which says a lot about society and, and the way we feel within it, perhaps. Um, which led me, as I've been thinking anyway about ambient forty years on, and we all have to to, to to consider the question: how ambient relevance. Is what, because what Ambrose was looking at, how it's changed over the last 40 years. And as a part of that, what does it, or what could it, now contribute to society 
and can that contribution, whatever it may be, can it be beneficial beyond serving the needs of a one-to-one -one listening encounter between the, the headphones and the individual? So how has its relevance changed, do you think, in 40 years, and what does it or what can it contribute to society globally rather than Take it. Sorry? Helps in my own thesis. <laughs> That's his contribution. <laughs> oh dear. You have changed, haven't you? <laughs> Lots of years. Sorry. Um, I would say climate change. It's, uh, from the moment that, that album was published to now, like, uh, uh, we have uh, other questions around the environment, or just um, like all these warnings that we have right now. And um, I am thinking of um, a concept which is called dark ecology. I am missing the author now. But, uh, uh, yes. Who is the author? Timothy Morton? Yes. Ah. yes. And um, uh, he is critical about uh, the term ambient in this ecological context because he's saying um, it is like uh, separating us from uh, like the other species and uh, we think like it's something that's around us but we are not part of it okay. and the way like yeah. it is um, Broadcasted and that, that it appears on the media. Uh, it's like, uh, ah, it is very green thing, it's the ambient, and we are guilty that we are against it and uh, we are uh, like uh, threatened to nature. Yeah. But um, he's uh, like uh, talking about the darkness in ecology, like other sites, we were talking to the question before, um, but um, there are more aspects and that we have also us in our bodies that um, we should not, uh, that, uh, could, uh, that there are other visions that could bring us uh, closer and more connected to, to the other species and uh, to whatever exists outside of our skins. So mm. I would say that um, it is critical um, in our field that we have also some awareness of what ambient means today with the climate warming in uh, the ecological context and we have like, a dialogue yeah. also from what we produce with this um, concept of ambient. Do you see your work as ecological in, in that way? Because it, it ties in very, very intimately with nature and, and how it's happening. I, I wouldn't necessarily want to put that ban on it. I just wonder if you see it that way. Because it could be seeing what you were talking to us about. Um, could be, I suppose, experienced in a very superficial way and, and just kind of going, oh, lovely, it's all multiplies. But do, do you see it as having a deeper kind of ecological engagement level as well in terms of trying to tell us something, engage in something deeper, so beneficial? Yeah, yeah, well, I think that's um, a field that I've become increasingly interested in in recent years um, and uh, we ran a conference um, at the University of Hull uh, last year called Sound the Environment which was uh, bringing artists and scientists together to look at the different ways that sound can help to deepen our understanding of environments. So um, bringing together different approaches uh, to, to the same thing. Um, so. Um, yeah, very much sort of influenced by the um, work of uh, Bernie Krauss um, and um, a couple of years ago I also went to the first uh, eco acoustic congress in uh, Paris. Um, so uh, I think, yes, um, um, the, the project itself is, is, is also a multidisciplinary project bringing together artists and with scientists. Um, but, how do you yeah. characterise its aim then? I think there are a number of different aims, and it's still something which is evolving okay. very, very quickly yeah, for yeah. that particular project. Um, one aspect of the live stream, for example, um, one hope is that it will be a resource 
for scientists to help uh, better understand and monitor how the, uh, the ecosystem and the plant habitat um, changes over time. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it's influenced by um, the ideas of Harmory Schaefer and the ways that we can uh, potentially perceive uh, the sounds of the environment as a, as a composition for shifting seasons, etc. Um, the origins of music. Yep. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, it, it shows that there's a, there's a desire there in this There's practice. an engagement with those ideas. Yeah. yeah. And, and it occurs to me too with what you were talking about yesterday, Victor, about this whole movement that built up in the early days in America with, these, uh, with the radio station. Was that, do you think, it sort of was touched on some things you said, but was that a kind of, um, was that serving, if you like, a, a deep need that society had for something that it was lacking? Was it, was it a benefit in that sense? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, at the time, they, at least in their early days, they didn't have a word mm -hmm. to put to what they were doing, you know, and, um, and now I think, Stephen Hill and other composers and artists, many of you are present here, think of ambient as something more um, aspirational rather than descriptive of uh, sort of music, but maybe it's something that music can aspire to. Um, okay. So I guess. Uh, if what you're asking is, you know, how can ambient continue to be relevant? Maybe it can continue to be relevant as um, as something to aspire to. Uh, I don't know if it would have if it would look the same as, say, music from the hearts of space, which yeah. is this very particular sort of utopian sure, sure. sound. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it, it's it's a question that's even heightened now because after after your your emphasis, David, on the capital A ambient, it, it got me thinking from both angles, really, both as devil's advocate and, and just being me. Um, uh, and I open this up to anyone who has a, a thought. Is, are, are there dangers in ambient being regarded or used as a means to an escapist end or as a kind of sonic an aesthetic, if you like. Are there, are there dangers in that? Uh, David, you would perhaps this, say this there word, were. This word danger again, yeah. I, I mean... Is it, is it problematic? I think there's some very interesting things going on at the moment, some very strange and interesting things. Like if you think of the presence on YouTube of, for example, ASMR videos, you know, of which there are thousands. And, you know, Does everyone know what they are? ASMR? ASMR? This is the extreme stimulation, close-up stimulation. Yeah, it's it's um, basically getting a tingle from yeah. either small whispery sounds, or small sounds, or touch of um, textural objects. It's an emphasis on tactility, isn't it? And yes. You, you listen very That's closely, right. and it's meant to sort of give you a certain type yeah. of so it's, it's sensation. Kind of listening. And there are thousands of people doing this on YouTube. And then also on YouTube you get um, things about wind in trees. There's a whole other group of people into that. And, you know, so it's a kind of privatisation, if you, are, if you like, of, of some of these ideas which are part of the ancestry of ambient. Becoming mainstream, but in this strange isolate sharing way. Mm. That is the contradictory heart of things like YouTube. Because it's socialised but it's individual. It's socialised but it's individual, yeah. And that's you know that's that's kind of weird <coughs> and it's it's new. Um, and many of the ideas many of these ideas become mainstream. I mean you talk about Mark Schaefer and, and you know, everybody says soundscape you know, you know, the BBC. Everything's a soundscape, isn't it? It's just like Anything that doesn't sound like a, you know, Beethoven symphony is a soundscape now. So, <laughs> um, 
all of these things have become very much part of the world we live in. But going back to your original very interesting provocation about the pills, the thing is, many things that could help that situation and um, help people so that they didn't have to take pills have been around for millennia. Mm -hmm. you know, and ambient music itself, which might also be helpful, has been around for a long time. You know, so yoga's been around, Tai Chi's been around, Qigong's been around, meditation's been around. Well, Rupert Medicare's been around <laughs> longer than most things. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the question is, why aren't they working when they quite obviously could be working? And, and so the pill popping, you know, you have to look at something else. You know, the, societal pressures and all the rest of it that are contributing to that situation where people have to resort to pills. And, uh, you know, if, if ambient music has a use value in that particular sphere, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. But if you're a, a composer who doesn't want to be limited by instrumentality, you know, by use value, then you have to think beyond that. How do you view your work, Richard, in regard to how it's used? And, and that's, yeah. that's really complicated for me. Uh, isn't that an instrument? Is it in the Geshe of Norwegian, which yeah. is it's very complicated. We never really anticipated what would happen with that. We were commissioned to write this music and asked if we could make a relaxing piece of music. And would be tested by. So that was, that was yeah. the request, something like that. Ray Box, you know, the Oh, yeah. 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 And they said that there was access to a music therapist and we could consult with them when we were doing it. And then they were tested. Some, some sort of scientific testing on the time, I don't know what else. Yeah. And miraculously, it turned out that we had made the most relaxing piece of music in the world ever. Yeah. So, and hence it became a new story and so on. I, I, you know, I think uh, it's had all sorts of kind of strange repercussions for us. Uh, it's, it's a lot to live up to. Yeah. Idea, but, uh, but, uh, but I mean, uh, the idea of a relaxing piece of music is just such a strange idea. I'm the only person who goes to sleep with headphones or listening to techno because I've done a full four really constant pace that is really kind of relaxing, so, you know, I, But you didn't feel it was in any way problematic either to create it or for it to be used? We found it, I mean, we found the scientific issues with it and trying and things like that, and some of the things that were kind of like that, an interesting challenge, and we, we thought that it sounded like quite strange for this kind of thing. But we were quite happy with the right it, and we really sort of an aesthetic thing as well. And kind of function. Okay. Uh, kind so you didn't feel it limited your artistic. I think it, it's uh, such a, a, a set of boundaries that were challenged, and, and we like that. You know, it's, it's, it's good to have to work within some constraints at times. It's, sure. it's positive to explore something and focus on a tight area. Cool. Yeah. So it's a question I've been wanting to ask for a long time. And I nearly submitted a paper for this conference about it. I'm not going to explain the question, I'm just going to ask it. And you can take it from there. Why is there so much bad ambient music? <laughs> Why is there so much Why? bad? Why is there so much bad? Okay, in that case I will I will expand that. Electronic because that's, music. music. Yeah. I'm I've, I have no statistical data to back this up, but I've long suspected that ambient as an idiom is more susceptible than some to, uh, yeah, to being um, churned out in a way that's perhaps not so straightforward in some idioms. And yeah, that, that's where that's coming from. And what do you think about that? You only become one person to go actually considerably easier. 
but I think that we can not have five years to have to two yeah, I'm going to have an Well, this is what I mean. I mean, idioms and pop and rock require a certain amount of extra effort, whereas you can just grab some software and you've got ambient in 30 minutes. And but why is there so much? I was, I was interested in the point uh, I think you made that the algorithm, uh, it's very easy to make an algorithm that makes ambient music. Is, is that right? It's very simple. Yep. You could make endless <laughs> ambient music with the simplest algorithm. So it's all yeah, actual stuff. No, 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 it's not struck by it because the implication is that it's basically it's not so complicated that, um, that uh, you need two complicated algorithmic uh, approaches to it. It's not straightforward to write such an algorithm, but um, the algorithms are less complex than for most other musical genres. Yeah. So the ease of making it. Is it must be a fact. Well, yeah, I'm just thinking historically, you know, the uh, emergence of capital A ambient comes simultaneously with the emergence of voltage control synthesizers and sequencers. Um, the central techniques of this style of ambient are the drone <coughs> and the loop. And this is, these are automatic or automated. Um, techniques of creating music, and so it's easy to churn out drums and loops. Uh, it's hard to do it well. And also the emergence of the non-musician. I mean, Brian, yes. And I, yes. Brian and I were both at art school at the same time. Uh, different art schools, but at the same time. And, you know, both of us are kind of, and he says as a non-musician, I don't say I'm a non-musician, but, you know, I certainly wouldn't say I'm a virtuoso musician. <laughs> Um, but in a way, we both had the same introduction to things. We both saw Christian Wolff play when he was doing his tour in England. And he played Terry Jennings and uh, Cage and his Stones piece, and uh, maybe Terry Riley, I'm not sure. Um, Brian saw it in Ipswich, I saw it at Watford, where Peter Schmidt was teaching. And it's all very well say, talking about being an art school musician as so if that's incompetent. But the thing is, you've gone through that training as, as an art student. Yeah. So you're not kind of helpless. You know, but if you haven't had any training in anything, mm. or any background in anything, and then you think, yeah, great, I'm a musician, you can just do something great, then the results will probably be different. Because contemporary music in the broadest sense of the word, is a wash with ambient. A wash. A wash. And I would say a wash with... Uh, I suppose there's another aspect to this. I mean, you said, Victor, that it's, it's easy to do, it's, it's not so easy to do well. And I think the idea of, of appraising it, the quality of it, has become harder too. Because, I mean, I wear two hats. I'm not just a composer, I'm also a, what's a better word, a critic. I write about music a lot, and I get sent quite a lot that falls broadly into this category. And it's funny how <coughs> with the increase, with, with so the ease of making ambient, and there was it, it, it instills a, a level of skepticism in me. <laughs> Every time I put something on that's of a certain, even by established figures these days, that, you know, I kind of feel that it's become almost harder than ever to, to appraise in, a, in some sort of meaningful way something that falls within ambient and that, if it's good, it's not because it's ambient, it's good for other reasons. And perhaps that's the only way to appraise music anyway. But it just seems to me that the ambient has a, has a, has a peculiar type of, set of susceptibility to be abused, misused, abused, whatever word you want to say. Well, I, although I would say, you know, the um, creation of so much ambient music that I wouldn't care to listen to is fantastic because. Uh, <laughs> Because that means uh, people are spending time, um, non-musicians and artists are spending time uh, working and getting pleasure out of it. You know, it's uh, uh -huh. pleasurable labor, yeah. um, creativity. I don't see, you know, as long as to not, a non-violent end, I think that's fantastic. I, I still want to listen to it, too. Sure. But what about the story you told me at lunchtime? Alt-right. Oh, yes. Well, that's... Uh, 
I think that's a product of discourse as much as music. So, um, has anyone heard of fashion? This is very, this is very much a tangential to <laughs> Simon's question. Um, fashion wave. It's uh, as in fascist. As in fascist. Okay. Um, so if you're familiar with the whole alt right movement in the U.S. right now, um, which is essentially this uh, neo Nazi contingent, um, they are identifying the history of synth wave and ambient music as their music. <laughs> because seemingly to them, it does not uh, incorporate the history of people of color. Um, and I think that's, op that's very clearly ignorant of the history of ambient music and uh, illustrates some of the dangers of talking about it in this purest way. Well, then you can't, can use the word danger. Yeah. yeah. I haven't encountered that. That's not so it's, 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 yeah. it's, it's scary. <laughs> yeah, so I, I say non-violent because I, you know, that is a violent yeah. like, what means of producing music. Mm -hmm. well, put your <laughs> <laughs> That's, it's, it's so good. Of it's, it's out there. Just, I have, I have um, one sort of final thought and then we'll kind of open it up if anyone else has any final questions in the last 15 minutes. But, um, a more general question again looking back, um, and this has come up a number of times in the last couple of days, uh, but I think you all have your own take on it. Has, I suspect I know the answer in the first part, has Ambient achieved everything it's capable of achieving? And if not, what potentials might still lie locked within it? Where could it go next? I'm just thinking <laughs> of uh, um, this um, connection to totalitarian views. Oh, yeah. um, and I am wondering uh, where you can handle it with totalitarian as a concept. Mm, that would be like. Um, um, I could challenge today because it's a longer threaten uh, in society and um, so, I, so I, the music could be threatened? No, no, I mean that um, like <coughs> this new version of um, fascism that we are witnessing like from the states and uh, across Europe and more our country in Colombia would have also like a fascist trend um, it has like uh, it's uh, different. Like you don't see so quickly. Uh, you don't have this distinction of bad and good. Like um, uh, women for Trump, or black people for Trump, um, transgender for Trump, now ambient for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it was in the time of Hitler, like it's, yeah, no, you yeah, yeah. couldn't imagine at that time Jews for Hitler. Now yeah. we have Jews for Trump also as black women, as women of color, and uh, uh, it's putting a big question for us to like uh, engage dialogues and uh, mm, be more aware of um, uh, differences and um, uh, when uh, ourselves in this kind of discussions we are being binary and we are being dichotomic and uh, how we can dismantle that when we meet the audience. Mm. I think humor is very important, like it's a tool. I used uh, one of um, our babies. Uh, yes. yeah. uh, that I think this kind of elements that uh, it was like in a question of it, not an immersion, because immersion can be a totalitarian mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. yes. So this kind of um, like Brecht, Bertolt Brecht, he thought about the uh, distance in theater, and he, he liked to put uh, maybe the staircases that actors used uh, in, uh, in some moment to make the uh, audience aware of this is uh, mm -hmm. set up. Mm. So I think uh, we are now challenged to 
think very carefully of what we can put in our compositions or pieces that can uh, raise these uh, questions for the uh, audience and the summers and uh, mm. yes, can like, uh, raise the level uh, for the population, for the society, not for this totalitarian sure. use. That's just made me think of something. Christina, you said something in your talk about there was only a, a sort of well, a throwaway remark. You said it in passing. You, you talked about with creating these spaces, and you talked about not wanting to manipulate anyone. That was your And I wondered whether I remember thinking at the time, is this a danger in ambient that we could sort of, we can set up these immersive spaces, and are we being somehow? in a disadvantageous way, manipulative of people. Was there something of that in what you meant? Um, or did I overread what you no, I mean, were saying? I think when I was thinking about that, I was more thinking from kind of a cultural heritage perspective, where ah, okay. you try not to yep. put a label on something. Yes. But, but I, yeah. I, you know, maybe I don't feel like we should manipulate people, but, yeah. <coughs> but mood is always of course. It just made me. It just made me think when, when Christine was talking about that because it occurred to me elsewhere about the idea of immersion. Because it, it could the idea of immersion is potentially the ability to, to sort of take hold of something, whatever. And a kind of hypnosis. Yeah. yeah. But to yeah. go back to your question, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I talked about. The potentiality of thinking about different ways of listening, different ways of thinking about sound, and, and um, radically different ways of thinking about silence. Mm. And, um, and then, you know, all these ideas um, about our relation to how we think about environment. Um, you know, these are pretty. Radical changes mm. possible there, and you know, I can see those growing, and I can see musics emerging that reflect those big, big changes. Um, and you know, all of these ideas are about ambient, you know, silence, and sound, and environment, and so on. Mm. So, if we come to have a radically different but, you know, if we hopefully don't end up in the fascist part, you know. All this thing is fascist. Yeah, yeah if, if they don't prevail, then, you know, many of these ideas will come to fruition and, and they'll change you know, culture and they'll change music. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think I do. Um, there's sort of two things I was thinking about. Um, one we talk about where, where might it go next, and I think uh, Christina's work is very much sort of uh, uh, investigating that, and the technologies mm -hmm. now allow us, um, in terms of non-linear non forms of music making, um, uh, Brian Lowe's Bloom app, for example, or yeah. um, Bjork's Biophilia, um, where the listener themselves uh, is actually engaged with that, with that process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just in my own work, um, for a whole host of reasons, I'm far less interested in trying to create a kind of linear narrative or a, you know, a, a teleology um, yes. and more and more become more installation based and uh, I think that is touching on these sort of wider cultural shifts and it's interesting um, as well. Uh, I think that uh, we've also touched on um, the fact that this sort of uh, social medias and um, the mass availability and sort of, in a way, modification of, of, of music and um, technologies that allow um, a much wider uh, range of people to be able to make music now. But we're actually moving back towards it, um, what music has been as a function within culture, cultures and societies for, for millennia, that is actually a group participatory experience um, and sort of hierarchies that we've gone through for a relatively short period of time 
for a few hundred years of you know, the professional musician, court, court musicians, for example, and, mm. and kind of actually um, uh, exclusive um, sort of modes. Of, uh, it's actually moving to a hopeful of potential and it, a more kind of democratic and uh, inclusive. Um, so I think it, it does touch on some. Yeah, much deeper, broader cultural shifts with potentials for. There's, there's obviously a, a, in a way, yeah. almost a polarization thing going on mm-hmm. at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Yeah. All the optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have just some minutes left. Does anyone? in the room have questions, thoughts, comments, or anything? Mark? Yeah, I'd just like to, to turn to that question of, 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 of ugly. I'm, mm. I spent a long time ago, I spent time reading Adorno's aesthetic theory, and there is this chapter, The Ugly, the Beautiful, and Technique, where he invites us to consider uh, using the ugly to, and sustaining the ugliness of the work to attack ugliness in the world. So there's oh. a resolution there. Yeah. And I think we can see that, we can see this easily enough in Baudelaire's poetry, for example, yeah. Lars Vigel, right? Yeah. But I think if you also consider someone like Wagner Kerner's of Burzum, the Norwegian black metal, Public Enemy in America, these are musicians who, who, who followed that call. And then he continues by, by saying that uh, um, strong work, valuable work, um, enacts a violence on material which, which resists the violence of its of its, of its modification. So there's a, a dialectic there, and I, and I wonder in relation to this ease of ambient whether there is no there is no engagement of that kind with the material. The material has offers no resistance any longer. Yeah. If you listen to those early pieces of Stockhausen that I was talking with someone about earlier, they too yeah. you can you can feel that there because of the challenges of manipulating tape. Yes. And then the last thing I'd say is that um, talking with Christian in the break it was a really interesting conversation about. The unknown um, and entheogenic properties of the world, uh, which I thought I discerned in Crick and Christian's investigation, and whether we have, how we might continue to respond to, to the summons of the material world as something unknown or incomprehensible. And so just acknowledge yeah. that and see yeah. in what way we might just say, well, this is there, this is a summons. Uh, we don't know what that call means or how we might answer it. Mm-hmm. And to return to Virginia Woolf, I'd say this is exactly what is behind Mrs. Ramsey's relationship to the lighthouse, the shimmer of that light, and was talking to Kristen about shimmer. Shimmer is that perfect word for yeah, yeah. describing some core which we can't understand, we yes. can't define it. And, and there must be some, there must be properties of music here, I think, too, which, which, which leave that incomprehension open. There's an interesting example. I, I just wrote sleeve notes for a reissue of uh, the two records David Sylvian made with Paul Bajukai. Uh, by the revolution and flux and instability. And um, I asked David if he had any comments. He, he sent me pages and pages of stuff about the circumstances of the first record. And it's all about, the, you know, it's freezing cold, um, and he couldn't get anything to eat uh, because he went to a cafe where they had nothing vegetarian, so he just ate bread. And, the place where he stayed was depressing, and then the studio, you know, the setup of the studio where Holger was working was, you know, completely strange. And and when I came to listen to the record, I realised, well, they made it in '86, mm. and um, so, you know, the whole Glasnost thing was not yet beginning, yeah. but about to begin. And you listen to that record, and it's, it's full of all the shortwave stuff going on. And it really feels like the atmosphere of that time, you know, the end of the Cold War. And it's kind of an ambient record, but it has dread, you know, it has um, a, a deep sense of unease. Um, it, it, it really feels like it doesn't know where the world is going. It's, it's trying to do something about it in the sense that it's, it's saying, well, here's a, here's a music which offers some solace in all this uncertainty and the feeling the world may come to an end. Yeah. So the feeling of resistance in it is really strong. 
And I'd, I'd never thought about that record in that way before, but it, it came across really strongly. And I think, you know, it was a particular time, in a particular context, in particular circumstances. And, and now, it's just, it's just so dead easy, you know, this stuff, mm. just blow it out. And, it's, and, and two, you think about fashion. And then suddenly you've got something to really think about, really worry about. And, and then might, maybe you could make something really good. Yeah. Multiple. Multiple. I was going to say, just following up from uh, David and Mark, I think one area is um, where I still perceive that sense of tension and fragility and kind of almost, not necessarily danger, but you're never at ease is in the work of somebody like Jacob Ullman, um, mm -hmm. you know, where you're, you are really straining to listen. It is music that just goes above the threshold of the, of the environment. Yeah. And yet, because of the instrumentality of the performance, you, know, you could very easily just perceive it as being very quiet, ambient, post Elvis, Vandal Weissery type music. Yeah. But at the same time, there's an intense fragility in it, and you are constantly absorbed by that fragility. And the extreme tension of the performers to make those incredibly quiet um, sounds. Um, so for me, there is that. It's rather different that that notion of resistance and tension um, is in something like that. And I think that's, that's quite an interesting uh, thing when you start to look at that, how some of those ideas of uh, ambient have been translated into instrumental music. But again, thinking of what Rupert said about oversaturation, I think for me, I, I actually ex I do experience that in Jacob Ullman's work, but I also experience it in Karkovsky's work, where you get this incredible onslaught. And if anything, it, it, it feels like a kind of a wildfire that's constantly poised to blow itself out because it's so intense. And, and this, this very gradual, very delicate, no one wouldn't often use a word like that to describe sort of noise music, but this kind of this delicate encroachment into cacophony. Yeah, I think that's why that, that can do a similar thing. As a, I still think of that as having an ambient. Well, it seems to me that's what, where the idea of like some of the fragility comes in, because some of the uh, when uh, Andrew and I have talked, and some of the some of the pieces that Andrew played today, there was that, well, on the one hand, there was some incredibly fragile sounds in there. Mm. The number of sounds gave a rather different impression, but actually you're left with a sense of actually real fragility and actually a very dynamic and um, well, a texture that is always disintegrating and reforming, even mm. though it has almost like the ocean, this sense of continuity that we would expect in a kind of ambient type music. Underneath it all, there is this constant regeneration and fragility and breaking down, which I think you know, it does give something very different to that particular type of music. So I think that in that respect, there are aspects of what we stereotypically think of ambient music and more noise-based music, of actually um, thinking that in similar kinds of ways. Yeah. Any other? Uh, I thought it was partly coming out of thinking about this thing about ambient music being quite male and white dominated. The one area where I've seen it um, gendered very differently and where most women are involved is when I come across kind of people in the area of New Age music, which I don't have that much to do with, but mm. it is, is very female dominated. Um, but that's not an area of music that's kind of involved in academia often. It's a different yeah. line of activity. And I think in, in that particular field, what I observe is different sometimes is that it's really not about the, actually the, the sound that is made by the music isn't actually all that important. Yeah. That actually, yeah. that, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is kind of what it achieves or what it... Um, the social function, is it? Well, yeah, well, yes, I guess so. And um, what comes as a result of the music, I suppose, is seen as the more important thing. Or, or at least that the music is only a part of the picture. And that even if the music's dull and not of any interest, you know, the recorded sound, that if the experience is powerful and useful, then that doesn't then the music is successful. Yeah. 
So rather than being good or bad, it, it's whether the music has fulfilled the function that it, it, it was chosen for. And so sometimes, sonically, the music can be what we might consider to be very interesting, or what I might consider yes. to project on anyone else, yeah, yeah. not very interesting. We might all agree with you. But, <laughs> but that the experience that people have is actually it is very, it's very interesting and it's very powerful and often it's that, I think that's one of the things that makes ambient music distinctive is that that element of context is an important part. That even when the music is more, much more intellectual and sonically interesting, it's almost never completely abstract. There's usually a context in which that, that sound is placed, which is also as interesting as the, as the music that generates. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, in, in the context of um, New Age in the 80s, and you mentioned that you know women are a, a big part of the scene, and I'm just thinking of some feminist writing about New Age, is that, yes, it offers no resistance. Um, that's the point. It's a, it's a recuperative space for socially embattled subjects. So in that sense, you know, maybe it's okay to have music that inoculates us and perhaps even accommodates us to neoliberal capitalism if we are aware of how we're using it yeah. and where it comes from. I think it's also interesting that there's a Grammy for New Age music. There isn't a Grammy for um, for ambient music, but there is a Grammy for for surround, for example, um, or three D recording. So I mean, it's interesting in the industry. What is part? Of, you know, there is no capital A in that way. There's a capital N A for new age. Government. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. To, yeah. I was just going to say. I think the way we sometimes the way we talk about ambient and how it's used for commercialized or whatever, or how it's appropriated and become commodified. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that to a certain extent all music has actually become commodified in that respect. Of course, you know, we walk into a posh restaurant and we don't expect to hear Nirvana. We expect to hear a nice Mozart string quartet mm -hmm. or something like that. You know, I know it's a crass example, but to a certain extent, you know, the, the function of uh, different types of music is very determined by where we have it, it goes back to Sati again, who talked about filling the space for dummies. What did you say, Richard? Uh, just one of the things uh, I think is interesting about New Age music is that the set of kind of commercial structures outside the record of music business. Yeah. You know, the set of their own labels, but there is just a little distribution. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. And that was early on, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the cassette tapes. Yeah, and the Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you have a final point? Uh, the, the, I mean, it's interesting what you say about I think the classical point is quite an interesting one. I find it quite satisfying to find many people treating all classical orchestral music as music. I mean, the, the yeah. classic FM thing. Yeah. I mean, so all Beethoven, Mark Bozo, Marla Bach, Debussy, the whole lot is just, it's it's just background listening music, really, but for an awful lot of people. Um, so, soft, soft classics. So, I mean, that's an interesting kind of social change in that conceptual I mean, and it's a return because a lot of that music was written right under contract by rich people yeah. for, for dinner music for court. Right. So it's a return to its original <laughs> So it's all come back to where it, yeah.